welcome to the Payroll Podcast with your host, Nick Day of JGA Recruitment, Specialist Payroll Recruiters. Hello and welcome to the Payroll Podcast. I'm really excited today. I've got one of the most passionate people there is about payroll joining me on the podcast on what is the eve of the World Cup semi-final. So I'm really excited in many ways today, hoping for an England victory later against Croatia. But today I am joined by 2018 Global Vision Award winner Max van der Fispersink. For those not familiar, Max is the payroll manager for the Netherlands for Royal Dutch Shell and boasts over 10 years experience in managing international payrolls and expatriates and in advising others on best practice methods as well. He is incredibly skilled in the development of control frameworks for international payrolls and he actually pioneered the development of the best practice method or global payroll control framework, which we also know as GPCF for short which he uses to utilise payroll strategies with the overall tax and business strategy of organisations. So we're going to find out a little bit more about that later. Max specialises in building payroll functions that are able to continually adapt to the ever-changing global payroll landscape. And he's passionate about finding constructive payroll solutions to sometimes very complex global payroll problems I'm keen to explore during this payroll podcast. Max has his own hashtag handle, which is hashtag passion for payroll, and he demonstrates this through his commitment to not just delivering world-class payroll operations, but also by his commitment to training, educating others in the international payroll world, delivering at exhibitions, and also, I guess, basically trying to make sure that everyone he, he touches can deliver the same level of payroll excellence for their business. Max has never shied away from praising the teams that have supported him to overcome the global payroll challenges that he has faced. And with this in mind, I'm keen to find out more about his views on what makes a great team leader. Now, Matt has extensive experience in all aspects of international payroll, from locals to expats and in-house to outsourced. He has published a number of articles and presented a number of conferences for the Global Payroll Management Institute, or GPMI. Previously, Max has held the positions of payroll manager at IPS Powerful People, senior consultant at PricewaterhouseCoopers, and payroll manager for Europe at Crocs before joining Shell in 2016. I'm sure you'll all agree, a fantastic individual to have on this podcast. I'm really excited to get started. Welcome, Max. How are you? Thanks, Nick, for the very kind introduction. I'm doing great. Um, really excited to have this podcast with you on your very special day in the semifinals against Croatia. Hopefully uh, for you, you will win. And hopefully for me as a neutral uh, viewer, it will be a fantastic game. I certainly hope. So what are your predictions, Max? Oh, boy. I think it might be down to penalties tonight. Oh, I hope not. I hope not. I think uh, <laughs> if we can get by once. I'm not sure two will be so lucky. I fancy us yeah. winning in a normal time. I'll say 2-1. Okay. I think it's All right. So look, I'm going to start early doors with this podcast by just asking a few questions. Five technical questions. But firstly, just to give some, I guess, background to those that perhaps aren't familiar with who you are, what you're doing, I'd like to find a little bit more about your journey within payroll today. So how did you get into payroll? What were the decisions that have led you to become payroll manager at Shell? I marked the day even in my calendar when I started in payroll, which is the 7th of June, 2006. So it's 12 years now I've been in payroll. And actually, my first ever full-time uh, real-life job was in payroll. I even gave a, a kind of a TED Talk thing about the whole topic of how I rolled into payroll. So I think you'll add a link to it uh, later is an, an APA talk. And it speaks a bit about how I actually dropped out of school when I was 20 or 19, I think then even. I really felt the need to start working and working in practice instead of only reading from books. I wanted to do both. So why not work full time and study at night, which uh, I must say was kind of tough. So I applied and I applied to many jobs. Uh, and finally, I got selected for a payroll administrator uh, job at my first company, IPS Powerful People, which is an uh, international secondment agency in the oil and gas and the dredging business. So they uh, recruited me and I started in payroll and I didn't start in just a domestic payroll. It was a global payroll to start with. So this was an amazing challenge for me. And what kind of struck me at payroll is that it seemed to be with numbers. It seemed to be with interacting with people. There was a lot of technology involved. When I was around, I think maybe nine or 10, and my father reminds me of this almost every time he sees me, it seems that I said, I really want a desk job. My dream job would be a desk job. And I wanted to work in an office. That would be my dream job. And now here wow. I am working in payroll. 
And then I, I had numerous uh, positions after that uh, at uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers because I wanted to see uh, what the outside world would bring. And I was working in Amsterdam then. And as you probably understand, a lot of global and European headquarters are located there. So and I had a great mentor, Elmer van Lien at PwC, who guided me. Uh, we advised a lot of international clients on our, our complex international tax and payroll situation. So that really elevated my knowledge on deep fiscal legislation. And after that, I wanted to go back into practice and work for Crux as a payroll manager in Europe, where uh, I really learned how to manage an, an outsourced payroll. And I was actually quite happy in that job. It was all going well. We hit all our targets in payroll, but then Shell comes. And if you live in an L, and maybe also in the UK, when Shell comes, you think this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. And luckily enough, I managed to be recruited and be chosen out of a few others uh, in the end. And I must admit that I'm in my dream job now because being part of a, a really a vibrant uh, global payroll community is Shell and all the opportunity it provides and led by global payroll manager, uh, Sheila Carter. Yeah, this is for me currently my dream job. So very fortunate to be able to say that I'm in my dream job. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's very rare. I think people ever get to experience what they call their dream job. I know that uh, your dream job is within payroll and a bit later on in the podcast, perhaps to find out a little bit more as to why this is your dream job and why payroll in particular you're so passionate about. So please do stay, uh, or all those listeners out there, I hope they stay tuned to find out more about that because it's a really exciting insight which I'm keen to get to. Before we find out about where your passion comes from, though, obviously you're a very experienced global payroll manager. So what do you feel are the current trends and key challenges affecting global payroll right now? There are a few, and it won't surprise people that technology is, of course, rapidly catching up on us. You think of robotic process automation, you think of maybe even machine learning in the future or the Internet of Things. Although I think the immediate uh, challenges are reporting and unlocking our payroll data. And I've spoken to a few people about, uh, about data and the use of data. Well, I think it's still a bit inwards that we use our data just to improve our accuracy, improve our processes, improve our uh, end-to-end processes as well. While others might say we might use our data for the more strategic business decisions, I still have to see that happening. Uh, We first need to understand our data, and that brings me to another trend. It's a changing profile of the payroll talent that, uh, Nick, you're probably well uh, known of considering your recruitment business. And I spoke to a someone from my network just yesterday about RPA and what the effect is on people uh, working in payroll. And although people say that robots will not replace people, and that's partly true, although a lot of cost savings also aimed at with RPA next to efficiency and accuracy, but it also means that something else is being expected by people who do like repetitive tasks, who do like the administrative part of payroll. They are then asked to be more of an advisor and place themselves in the position of others and advise them on why payroll matters to them or why our data is important to their decision making. So it might not mean that we lose a lot of jobs, but it might be that the persons who are now fit for the job are not fit for the job in the future or at least need to be trained. So I think that's a a huge trend that I'm seeing now. And of course, you see uh, governments uh, rapidly making more efficiencies in the way they do their filings and having an increasing need of timely data. You've seen it in 2006 already in NL. And when we automated our filing process, you've seen RTI, you've seen DSN in France, you see a single touch payroll in Australia. I believe that there are other countries that are, are doing the same. I think Finland is doing some work in that. So I think payroll is seen as a as a value driver and a, a big source of data for the government for their decision making. So those are some of the big trends I see right now in global payroll that will affect how we run global payroll in the, in the foreseeable future. Yeah, I agree. I think you made an interesting point on the task being automated, and there's a, a key distinction to be made here for those that are concerned about you know whether RPA will will affect the industry in terms of jobs being lost. I think the key behind RPA is it's going to automate tasks. It's not necessarily going to replace people. It's just that the roles of the payroll professional will change. And certainly as a recruiter, we're not seeing any kind of slowdown in the amount of business that we're doing, which is great. In fact, what we are seeing is a slight change in what people are looking for. So there's a real rise in a requirement for strong stakeholder management skills, the ability to present at board level or present to managers and the ability to analyze reports and things like that. And there's a less less of a requirement for the more, as you say, data-driven automated tasks, which are things that hopefully RPA will be able to speed up and make more efficient. So it's the tasks that I think are going to be automated rather than jobs themselves. And I think that's a really key point to make for those that are concerned about the introduction of RPA. 
But from your perspective, Max, how can a business then future-proof its global payroll processes from some of these emerging trends? Are there things that people can be doing now to protect themselves? Well, for instance, just uh, what we're talking about, RPA, the impact of it, you see that other skills are required since we already know that now an RPA will need some time to fully kick in into our end-to-end processes. If stakeholder management is something that you have not done before, there are plenty of training opportunities or maybe some mentoring within the organization that you can partner with to learn those skills. Or you hear a lot on data and data and more data. Maybe you can go into a course or learn from other areas in your business that already use data and say, what is data? What can you extract from it? What brings an insight from data? Is it a push? Hey, see how great my dashboards look like. You have to use my dashboard or do you have to go into the business and say, hey, what do you actually need? So let me see if my data can provide it or I need to partner with a different uh, line of business, for instance, with finance or with talent management to actually give you that data set that supports your decision making. And, you know, it's a million dollar question, probably how to future proof your global payroll. I think we can make it fairly simple. If your senior leaders step into the more strategic part of the business that know what the intention will be in, let's say, uh, three to five years, Will there be a lot of mergers? Will there be a lot of acquisitions or divestments? Will emerging markets be uh, penetrated with new stores or whatever industry you're in? If you know that up front, you can already make an assessment of, hey, do we have strong partnerships from a payroll perspective there? Are we running it in-house? Are we scalable? Or can we downsize if we divest a lot? And I think empowering a lot of people in your organization to say, go to a networking event, go to a conference, go to a webinar, do whatever you want to bring those latest practices in and to understand what payroll has to offer. Then you have that external lens that you can bring into and then feed into the senior leaders in VP or a global payroll manager who does talk to those key stakeholders that make strategic decisions and say, hey, it might be that if we want to penetrate uh, Latin America, but we only have a small local office that runs an in-house payroll for 100 people, but we might scale up to 2,000 people. Hey, let's look at that market. Let's talk to some peers that we have met in our network to say, how do you run payroll if you have uh, maybe 2,000 employees compared to 100 employees? And what does that to your global organization and maybe your operating model? For sure. I think you make some really fantastic points there. I think one in particular I'd like to mention is, you know, sometimes I think we payroll people can get a little bit tunnel vision to thinking the only courses they can do are payroll related courses for development. And actually, there's a wealth of other training that you can do to advance your career, whether that's more generalist courses like stakeholder management, uh, how to become a great team leader, fiscal, whatever it might be. I think it's important that certainly those that want to progress their career do have a look at the wider context of training that might be able to help them develop. And as you mentioned, networking, I'm a huge advocate for networking and leveraging your connections and utilizing the sources we have at our disposal, whether it's LinkedIn or whether it's local networking forums, whatever it might be. But there's a huge wealth of talent and expertise out there that sometimes if you just ask the question, you'll be amazed about the kind of response and support you can receive back in return. And particularly within payroll, it's a very supportive community. So if there is someone out there that's struggling with a particular question or not sure how to scale up or how to future proof, you know, throw the question out there in a public forum and you'll be surprised at how much advice you might get back in return. And some some really fantastic points. And let me just step into that quickly. If anybody has a question on payroll, you can always contact me on LinkedIn. I can refer you. This week alone, I had four or five calls with people out of my network that just wanted to talk to a person who's in the same position or has been in the same position or maybe knows someone who was in the same position. And you'll be amazed by how open everyone is to share their payroll story. Because if you talk to someone outside of payroll, they don't always understand the situation we are in. So just talk to each other. That's already a huge benefit. So yeah, I would certainly echo your comments. Absolutely. Well, if with your permission, Max, I'll add your LinkedIn profile to the episode notes so people sure. can access it quickly if they need to. Five quick questions. What do you consider then to be your key business strategies for you for leading a world-class payroll operation at Shell? What are the key things you put into place there that, um, in my words, are world-class payroll, but certainly that's the perception that that you've created there with the operation you're managing, Matt. So tell us a little bit about what those strategies are. Yeah, for for me, it's, it's all about balance. And since we, for instance, report into the HR line, you need to have a deep understanding of what the key strategic business objective of HR are. For instance, and nowadays you hear HR speak a lot about being employee centric, having an employee value proposition and making more impact against less cost or falling light on your organization and not forcing our uh, rigorous processes on line managers, on individual contributors saying, wow, 
I just want three clicks and I want to be where the answer is instead of searching through forms and click here and being redirected again. Or I just want to be able to contact someone 24 seven. So for me, it's how to balance our operating model, our talent pipeline, our retention plans and our technology in such a way that supports the strategic direction that HR is moving to. And for us, that means how can we make sure that everyone trusts payroll for a timely and a correct payment? And if they have a question that they are only three clicks or two clicks away from that answer, and if they cannot find the answer that they immediately are able to contact someone in a service center or in country, if it's a more tax related question that we can help them and have that personal touch to them. You know, you have high touch processes, you have low touch processes. For low touch processes, you can have a more portal instruction or an employee self-service. For high touch processes, such as an international relocation or a first time on a payroll when you are originally from Brazil and you come to NL, and there's a whole set of information waiting for you. Where are you socially assured? Where are you text? And you want to have the right information at the right time for a person that's making life decisions. Shall I bring my family or not? What are the consequences? And I think for us, the key business strategy is to have people say, I trust payroll. That's a great organization. I never distrust them. On them, I can rely and they're always accessible. Fantastic. In relation to trust, then, there's obviously a big compliance issue as well. So you've got to make sure that in order to gain that trust, that your function is always completely compliant, which can be complex when you're looking at global payroll compliance. So with compliance changing all the time, how do you go about ensuring you know, that your global payroll compliance is always up to date? And what are the sort of challenges you've had to overcome to ensure you can remain compliant? For me, there's always a zero risk appetite towards compliance because we talked about doing courses on stakeholder management and I really support it. But our basis is always know your payroll legislation, sure. know when you are compliant or not compliant. For me, that's basically having those interactions with other lines of the business. For instance, we have connects with HRIT that support us from the IT side. We have connects with, for instance, in NL, we have a thing called taxation meetings where we have HR policy, where we have employment tax, where we have local finance and payroll sitting together for two to three hours in a room each quarter discussing what's happening in their field and if it affects any other businesses. So for us, it's knowing upfront what will happen if HR decides to change the policy. We want to be at least involved in the decision making before the policy takes effect, for instance. If there are fringe benefits that are given, you know, every country has their own rules on taxing uh, fringe benefits and has different reporting lines. So internal payroll organization, we need to make sure that for the countries where we run payroll in, we are educated just enough to understand where to red flag a potential compliance risk. So we know that we need to talk to the business and it's okay to not know every detail, but you should know enough to place that red flag and say, hey, there's something going on here. Let's find someone who knows more about it before we implement this. Sure. Uh, and next to that, if you have your processes running, ensure you have a framework, and we talk about that later, that ensures from a holistic view that you always are compliant and that you always identify risks enough and that you are able to mitigate them with controls that are actually effective and that are not just a checklist for the sake of an audit, but actually add value by ensuring that you are compliant. I read as well somewhere that you, something you wrote, Max, you said the great compliance benefits, not just the business, but also the employee. So what did you mean by that? Can you talk to me a little bit more about how you feel great compliance can benefit the employee or the end user, if you like? Yeah, it's basically uh, reversing it by saying, if you are non-compliant, you could have your best salesperson pitching you for the best deal ever. Absolutely. If this person is, is in a financial situation because you are non-compliant in payroll and then files an income tax return and gets a big bill, this person might not be motivated to give that once in a lifetime presentation for us. And that maybe dishearts some payroll professionals, but we can be the biggest dissatisfier. We can hardly be a great satisfier. And we should take pride in not being a dissatisfier instead of always trying to be a satisfier. For me, there's great satisfaction if people don't see us as a dissatisfier. And that talks to compliance as well. For instance, if you're not compliant and you have to make a retro adjustment to someone's pay, it could mean that someone could not pay their mortgage that month or cannot take uh, their children to a party. Maybe I'm exaggerating a bit. It always has to be on time. It has to be right the first time and you have to be compliant. And of course, you know, when you're in business and you pay 80,000 people, stuff will happen. So if you do find an error, always immediately be transparent 
don't try and hide it and just change something in payroll and hope that the employee won't notice. What I've seen in my 12 year career by now is if you inform people upfront, if you are non-compliant, they are more willing to cooperate with you than if they found out themselves. Sure. It takes a lot of courage to be transparent about an error made, but that speaks about the culture you want to bring to an organization or even to a local payroll team where you can say, you can make errors, but you cannot make an error that you're hiding. Sure. I think it's amazing as well. In all industries, not just payroll, certainly it's true in recruitment, but actually sometimes your fiercest critic or complaints can become your biggest advocate if it's handled transparently and I want to move on a little bit and find out a little bit more about you before we go into some more technical questions. Um, The second part of this podcast, in particular, we're going to find out more about why you're so passionate about payroll and also a bit more about your GPCF framework, which I'm really excited to talk about. So before we do, let's find out a little bit more about you, Max. Time to find out more about you. How would your friends describe you and how would your work colleagues describe you? That's always an interesting question. That's almost a job interview question, <laughs> Nick. I'm good at that. Um, yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. So probably describe me. We should, of course, actually ask them, but I think they would call me ambitious. Indeed, uh, passionate about payroll. They know I am passionate about payroll. I think they call me uh, a bit uh, self-aware. They <laughs> know that I know what I can do when I can't do. And I'm not afraid to say, yes, I do something well or I do something not well. For instance, if uh, I just moved house now, you, you should not ask me to do anything on home improvement or do it yourself okay. because the house will be a wreck in no time. <laughs> I am really good in, in payroll and, and writing courses and doing anything technology. But if you would give me a hammer, I would not know what to do with it. Uh, I think they would also call me a family man, especially since my uh, young daughter was born one and a half year ago. And they would say that I have some black and sarcastic humor. And I'm not afraid to not use it. So in business, to make that link to how Cause described me, I try to be less sarcastic and black humor. But since it's so embedded in who I am, I think they would say the same. Uh, And I think I'm not that different at home than I am at work because I bring myself to work as well. And myself means uh, certain attributes. And the thing that I'm most proud of uh, is that people call me authentic. I am who I am and I'm not afraid to show who I am and I won't change myself to a certain extent, to fit in somewhere else. This is me, and people respect me for that, and I respect them for who they are. So, for instance, in a, in a speech I gave, I thanked people for being them. I think that's one of the biggest compliments you can give. And I think my colleagues would also call me a go-to person. But also, I can be a bit stubborn. If there is an idea in my head, it takes a real good argument to take the idea out of my head again. Uh, so sometimes uh, people say, Max, You just really have to trust me now. This is not a good idea. And then if someone says that to me, then I know, okay, I should just trust this person uh, and say it's not a good idea. Excellent. Very honest answer. And I think sarcasm goes down very well over here in the UK. So (laughs) we have no problems there, which is good. Interesting. Interesting. (laughs) Tell me something about you then that perhaps others won't know about you. Yeah, I think what they won't know about me is that I'm a real music lover. Some people might know this, but the genres I listen to are so widely spread that people sometimes think, really, can you listen in one playlist to that kind of music? It could be classical violin music. It could be a hard style. It could be metal. It could even be a love songs wow. in one playlist. It just depends on the mood. And especially when I write courses or I need to write an article, I love to listen to classical violin mu- music that brings me in kind of a a melancholy mood and then my head spins around and all these ideas come in my head that then end up in a gpcf for instance any particular violinist that you would be recommending was a particular track you always go to as a go-to track before presentation or before talk no not really a go-to track but i really listen to a dutch violin player janine jansen who has a great interpretation of vivaldi and brahms and bach I think she's done a great job in bringing the violin to life. And I've been to one of her concerts in Amsterdam. It's been amazing. I'm passionate about payroll, but if you see these people on stage, they lose themselves completely in a play or in the violin. And uh, that's really, well, actually fueled my passion for payroll, saying, wow, this is what passion should look like. Fantastic. Well, to flip the question slightly, uh, people may not know about me is I actually did grade one violin at school. Oh, wow. (laughs) A long, long time ago. I couldn't play it now. So you are abducted by aliens. They want to learn more about our species. What item would you take with you? Oh, an item, so not a person. So that would probably be my MacBook. Okay. I must explain why. Well, basically, it has all my payroll readings on it. It has my music on it. 
and it has all my photos and videos of my family on Excellent. it. Excellent. I don't know what my battery would be if I bring it, but at least I have some time to still read, listen, and look at my most favorite And things. work, apparently, and work. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, what game or instrument would you teach them? Oh, well, uh, you can maybe teach them the violin if we're abducted together. <laughs> but I think a game would be hide and seek. And I would probably uh, let them count to maybe uh, two to four minutes so I can run as far away from them and as I can. And get away. Nice, nice. Intelligent. Thor's just strategizing all yeah. the time, Max. I like it. Exactly. What would you tell them about humans? Well, that in the end, we might think we're all different, but we're really not that different and we're quite alike. We all want to be appreciated. We do. I definitely agree with that bit. Yeah. What truth or human trait would you hold back? I think that we can never really find peace of mind or peace with each other, because if I hold that back, and I'm not in the holding back business, but if I hold this back, they will find out themselves anyway. Sure. Because we are who we are. Oh, very nice. I like that. Fantastic. Well, listen, we're going to dive back in now to find out more about your GPCF, your passion for payroll, and many other things as well. So please, uh, listeners, stay tuned. It's going to be an exciting final to the payroll podcast. Einstein famously said that insanity was doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We believe it's time to try a new approach to recruitment. JGA Recruitment specialise in recruiting the top 15% of payroll and HR talent using innovative 24-7 attraction strategies that are proven to improve quality of hire, candidate retention and return on investment. De-risk your recruitment process today and hire better talent faster with JGA Recruitment. Visit jgarecruitment.com to find find out more five quick questions question i'd like to start with and something i'm really keen to find out more about is this global payroll control framework so gpcf which is something i know you develop personally max and i know you feel this is a really great framework that other businesses could also develop so can you tell the listeners you know a little bit more about what the gpcf is why you think it's good practice to have one and of course how other businesses can get started with their own GPCF. Yes, sure. And the GPCF took around five to six years to develop, and it's evergreen, I think. And I keep on developing it with new insights and starting in it PricewaterhouseCoopers. And I gave a webinar about a GPCF that took like three to four hours. So let me try to summarize that in two minutes, Nick. It basically is a cohesive and holistic system to ensure global payroll compliance. It's not just a document, it's an idea and a way of working and a culture embedded in a global payroll function that does ensure compliance. And for me, the larger the global payroll uh, function is, the more there is a need for like a strategic direction in maybe a mission statement saying, why are we here? Why is the global uh, payroll function here? And who do we want to be as a function, whether you are working in country in Malaysia, whether you're in a shared service center in Krakow, or you are an outsourced provider doing a payroll for us as a client. We all need to buy into that one mission statement. And from that, the GPCF says, okay, that's all fine, but let's make some objectives now. And following COSO's model of the integrated framework, internal control integrated framework, uh, you would have operational objectives, you would have reporting objectives, and of course, compliance objectives. And the way they are designed also is highly dependent of the context you're working. So know who your internal and your external stakeholders are. Know who your customers are and know your internal and external environment that really sets the scene for a global payroll function. If you are working in a a banking business or you're working in a retail business, it's a completely different environment and an expectation of a global payroll function. And from those objectives, people can say, okay, looking at our context, looking at our environment, these might be risks that adversely affect the success of those objectives. And let's list them down. And from that, you can say, okay, out of these risks, I want to share this risk with finance. I want to share this risk with the service center leader, or I want to share this maybe with finance or legal. And these risks, I accept, I don't want to mitigate, but I knowingly not mitigate this risk. So that's also a part of risk management. And then you end up maybe with a subset of risks that you really inherently want to uh, mitigate by a control. And then you start designing those control activities. And uh, really, that makes sense. It can be an automation control. It can be a user profile set up in a system. It can be a control can also be a quarterly review of risks because you have such a high changing business. It might even be on a monthly basis. And when I present courses around this model, And I ask people, please bring your controls to the course. And then I ask them, so out of these controls, can you tell me what risk you're trying to mitigate? 
And then typically uh, it ends up in a high percentage that they say, well, actually, I don't know. Or yeah, there was that one error four years ago that led to this control and we actually found nothing after that. So we say, well, do you then still need to perform this control or do you just perform this control because you like it or it's designed by someone else? So please stop doing it. That actually also frees up time to increase other controls. A big part now that I also learned that uh, when I was at the American Payroll Association Congress is that we need to be much better in payroll branding, which means let's tell the organization in you know, one killer slide of what we're doing. And that's part of information and communication. Say, hey, these are all the risks that we have assessed. And if we don't mitigate them, it would result in this horrible situation. So that's why we need so much FTEs in not only designing, but also operating these controls. And by the way, we pay in 80 countries in 20 different currencies. This is the annual payroll tax bill. This is the annual net bill. This is the payroll expense. And this is the payroll team that ensures that we are compliant. And for me, that could be a global payroll control framework that's designed specifically to an organization from a more holistic view. Right. You start noticing that I'm really passionate about yeah. this. So if you want to extend the podcast to four hours, we can do it, but we should probably No, no, not. fair enough. I think we're going to include some links that you've got to, uh, <laughs> to more information on the control framework. Yeah. It sounds like my interpretation is correct, though. A, that this is something that all businesses, regardless of size of payroll function, could benefit from having such a control framework, but also that it's quite a proactive framework. So it does involve actually going to heads of department, ascertaining what the risks are, assuming I'm interpreting this correctly, ascertaining what those risks are, and then developing the framework around those risks. So it does mean or require the payroll manager, if you like, to be quite proactive in ascertaining what the risks are to learn how to control against them. Would that be correct? Well done, Nick. You could be a payroll professional uh, there's, now. There's, I will put a link in <laughs> okay. the episode notes for people if they want to read more about this, because there is some uh, a wealth of literature that, that Max has put together that might be helpful. So I'll include that in the episode notes. In yep. all of your work, you always remember to praise your teams. And I think even the questions, people are getting a feel for that already through this podcast. So I'm getting the sense that you're a huge believer in leading from the front, but also taking teams with you, getting them to buy into your vision and supporting them. So what qualities do you think make a great leader? And why do you think strong leadership is so important? I think the success of a team is down to how a team is led. And if that team is led successfully, then you are a great leader. For me, that's about empowering your staff to be the best that they can and to also see them as a person, not only an employee or a team member. They bring their home situation to work. They bring their work situation to home. So you need to have a key eye for what's going on in the lives of employees and how you can support them. For instance, uh, working from home or maybe doing some virtual work or maybe looking at different sides of payroll business that they're good at. And for me, empowering them means that they can go on their own into the organization and let's not micromanage them and say, I want to review everything what you're doing before you go to a senior leader. No, I trust you. And you should trust me. So if you ever feel insecure about something that you're going to do, or you want me to review an email, or you want me to review something else, then I'm here for you. And I will always respond within a day. People know from me, I will always respond in a day. I might not answer you, but I will respond within a day. So people know that they can rely on me. And you should be able to walk the talk. You can make lovely spreadsheets. You can make lovely presentations and mission statements. But if you're not acting on it, and if you're not all also just chipping in on a little bit of the work, instead of being, I sometimes call it a forwarding machine, every request that you get, you forward to your team. Maybe you should look at it first yourself and see if you can engage the team, yes or no, or maybe you can do it yourself. And if you do walk that talk, then people can buy into it. For me, being in the Netherlands, we also like to be a bit blunt to each other and tell me the honest story. I don't need to hear a story that you actually do not buy into because people, at least for me, since I'm really authentic, they would notice. So I might say if a change is forced upon us, then we say, okay, this is probably not inside of our control. We cannot change it. So let's just accept this change, although portions of it I might not support. But let's say that maybe other senior leaders who have a broader perspective, let's trust in them for making the statement and let's do the best that we can within our power to actually make that change happen. Although we might not support it, we still have to do it. So let's not dwell on being angry at change, but let's just make the best out of it. And hey, who knows, this might benefit us from making this change actually happening into being having a seat at the table when the decision is made the next time. So engaging your team and talking to them, seeing them as a person 
and empower them to be the best that they can. For me, that would make a great leader. Fantastic. I think um, something that comes across from your answers, Max, is you, I always say this in recruitment, but you can teach skills, but you can't teach attitude. And you seem to have a really positive attitude about every kind of challenge that's thrown at you. So I've got a quick question, just to change it up slightly. How then do you manage someone who is being obstinate or is being particularly difficult or challenging as a team member? Have you had any examples where you've just found it really difficult to motivate or really difficult to get someone to buy into your vision? And how have you handled that? These situations, of course, occur and it should never be an us versus them. So us being, oh, we want to be the change and them being, oh, I don't want to change. I just want them to see the benefits of changing and telling them the honest story and saying, I don't want to change your attitude. It's okay for you to not buy into this strategy, but the fact of life is that we will have to change to do this. So I'm not asking of you to say, yes, I fully support. You can say, I don't support, but since I'm in this role, I will deliver. That's something that I always expect people to do. You do have to deliver. You have to stay true to yourself. If you don't agree, it's okay to say to not agree. I'd rather hear you say that than say, yeah, I agree while thinking, geez, this is a BS story that I really don't buy into. And sometimes it's okay to agree to disagree, although I will always put in all the effort to let the others see the benefit of a change. But at some point, you know, you have to say, let's focus on delivering instead of me trying to convince you of this change. Let's agree to disagree and deliver as a team together. And then in the end, we'll probably be a successful. I love that. Don't have support, but you do have to deliver. I'm going to bottle that and use it again. I think that's a fantastic response. I'm glad yeah. I asked. So look, I couldn't have done this podcast without asking you a little bit more about your own hashtag. And for those that aren't familiar, it's hashtag passion for payroll. Can you tell me a little bit more about why you in particular are so passionate about payroll, perhaps why others should be too? Why payroll? Why is it so fantastic? Well, you're fueling my passion now. So passion is about, it's almost a strong and and barely controllable feeling and urge to do something. And for me, that's what payroll is. I wake up and I think, ah, I'm going to my commute and I can open my MacBook. I can do my LinkedIn research on payroll. I can read my reports. What's so fantastic for payroll is it's actually the best of many worlds. If someone doesn't know what their career would be or they don't know what to do yet, I would say start in payroll because payroll for me has the best of HR. It has the human touch of HR. It has the policy part of HR, how to motivate people. It has the best of finance. If you want to work with numbers, you can work in payroll. It has the best of legal. If you want to work on a GDPR, how to be compliant with data privacy, how to be compliant with employment law and international commuting and how to make a work permit, you can work in payroll. If you want to have the full hard tech side of things and want to read bilateral tax agreement or a totalization agreement, or you want to know where someone is taxed, yes or no, you can work in payroll. We have all of that. I can go on and on. We have the best of everything. If you want to work with technology, we are at the front end of technology. We are interfacing with global HCM systems. We are interfacing to the government. We are embedding on robotic process automation. And you can do that in an environment where we have a wealth of data and where we are controlling almost the biggest cost compared to other businesses. The biggest cost of a company is typically personnel. And you are actually assuring that that's recorded in a GL properly. And you are able to design global end-to-end payroll processes with taking the best of HR, finance, legal, technology, IT into one function called payroll. I would say you would be fooling yourself to not start it. What a fantastic response. I think I need to snippet this little section out, Max, and put it right at the front of the podcast. I'll have a new one altogether for anyone that's feeling a little bit demotivated right now. I mean, if you're working in payroll... And that doesn't motivate you to say, hey, I've got a fantastic career and a great opportunity. I don't know what would. Brilliant response. Love it. Absolutely love it. And I think I'll put it back to you, Max. If if I am working in Pearl right now and I'm feeling a bit demotivated, I'm feeling a little bit undervalued, perhaps by some of those functions you just mentioned. What would be your response? What would be your advice to someone to try and pick them up out of the doldrums and say, hey, I've got a great career beyond what you've just mentioned. So if I'm in that particular payroll right now, I'm feeling a little bit hard done by feeling a little underappreciated, what would you say? Yeah, I think firstly, I would say if you work in payroll, you have to be intrinsically motivated instead of extrinsically motivated. We rarely receive an email from the organization saying, hey, thanks for paying me on time (laughs) again. You are doing such a great job. Let's face it, are we always sending an email to the finance team that always records a manual journal entry all the time saying, hey, oh, you've done a fantastic job. You have cleared my balance account this time on NetPay. 
it's amazing. No, we also don't do that. Do we send an email to the salesperson who has done a great job in getting a new project in that actually ensures you have sufficient funds on your account paying net pay? No, we also don't do that. So let's just be proud of ourselves for delivering every time and each time and on time. And let's praise each other first. And if you do want that external recognition, then take on the challenge to not always start a conversation with someone else about an error or about something you disagree with, but say, hey, you have done a great job on this. And by the way, I also want to share the story that we are doing and make one or two slides saying, hey, this is payroll. This is where we need you. This is where we can support in delivering our objective, which basically says, let's not uh, dissatisfy employees by a non-timely delivery of pay. And I need you to do this. So help me to motivate our staff to do the best they can and let them not be dissatisfied. So go out there and talk to them, but don't expect others to do what you are also not doing yourself. Another great response. And for those not aware, it probably gives some insight as to why you were recently awarded the GPMI's 2018 Global Vision Award. So you received the award during the American Payroll Association's APA 36th Annual Congress in National Harbour, Maryland. And I know it's an award that recognises leaders in global payroll. So to win that award from the American Payroll Association, how did that feel? Yeah, I think that was an, a, a once in a lifetime feeling sitting there in a room with over 2000 payroll professionals. And then uh, Dan Mannox, the executive director of the APA and Mary Holland were on stage. And then they say they introduced a new award and then almost a award like video started playing of who it was. And then the characteristics of the person were shown. And I thought halfway through it, hey, this might be wow. me. This might be this Dutch person who is now in Washington, who is so fond of payroll and breeds payroll from the moment that he wakes up until the moment that he so goes to bed. You didn't know there was an award called the Global Vision Award? No, wow. I didn't know. Okay. I'm the first ever recipient wow. of the award because it's the first time it's uh, awarded to someone. So I have it in a proud place at home now. It's an actual award. And I'm so humbled to have received it. And I, it started for me in a holiday in 2000 and, yeah, 2015 when we were, I think, in, in Spain on a holiday with some family members. And when everyone was reading a novel, I wrote a book on tax <laughs> insurance because I couldn't let go of my passion for payroll. And that fueled an idea saying, hey, this might be worth an article. So why not be bold and just send an email to the Global Payroll Management Institute, GPMI, saying, hey, this is uh, maybe a good idea for uh, an article. Uh, how do we go about that? And they responded, yeah, why not? And that actually started me being uh, external as well and starting those educations. And I thank GPMI so much for allowing me to come up with just another crazy idea that then uh, Mary Holland, I mentioned her from GPMI and Nicole Smith from GPMI that then say, oh, Max has a new idea. Let's maybe see if we can accommodate it. And now I'm, I've done a few webinars. We did a lot of courses together. And it's also a compliment to my team at Shell and my other teams, basically, that allow me to go for a week at Congress. And they say, Max, you can go. We'll take care of the house. We'll take care of the shop. Just go over there. If there's something wrong, we'll call you. If not, have a great time. And that's for me also building from the empowerment of people saying, hey, you can do whatever you want. I'm not in an ivory tower saying, oh, I do magic stuff as a manager. They know what I'm doing and they know if I'm a week away, some things they'll have to do, some things I'll pick up uh, when I'm back. So they are also part of this award. And yeah, it just fuels my passion even more. And I'm so humbled to, to have the award. So I thank everyone that contributed. Fantastic. Yeah. I think the recruiter ears of me can't escape the fact that you mentioned how you developed your profile. I think it's a little tip that everyone can take note from. If you want to raise your personal profile, there is nothing stopping you from approaching any of the many publications, be it GPMI, GPA, CIPP, whatever it might be, is saying, hey, I've got an idea, I've got an article, I want to get more involved, could lead to a future vision award for someone listening to this podcast. And I think it's a great, great yeah. piece of advice. I want to know as well, presumably then, if you didn't know about the award, you didn't have a speech prepared. It must have been a bit of a heart-stopping moment going up on stage. What did you end up doing? I mean, did you give a speech? Oh, yeah. Honestly, I could have done a better <laughs> job. I was so overwhelmed. At least I thanked the person that I wanted to thank. Uh, and I actually remembered that the previous president was in NL and they used the word gezellig, which there is no equivalent in English. So I dwelled on that a bit. And I ended up promising that I would go to the American Payroll Association Congress every year. So that's a, a lifetime commitment I took on stage to be at Congress every year. But I'm happy to do that because, as you mentioned as well, you know, if you would have a tip, then go out there. Everybody has a story. 
I speak to four to five people in my network every week who are in either an RFP for a global vendor or who are changing their operating model. We can only learn so much from a slide pack or from an article. We need to connect to each other. And I've never had a payroll professional in my 12 years time that turned me down and saying, hey, can you help me? Can we just hop on a 30 minute call? Why not? Go and do that. You can be high up. You can be a payroll administrator. Go and tell your story. Everyone has a story to tell. And believe me, the payroll community wants Brilliant. to listen to Brilliant. So I once read, I think you mentioned uh, one of the sayings that perhaps doesn't translate in English a moment ago that you mentioned on Spage, but I once read that you were guided by two key sayings. The first were words of Epictetus, which goes like this, make the best use of what is in your power and take the rest as it happens. And the second is that you were driven by the motto of Michael D. Montaigne, which is, what do I know? Now, I'm someone who gets inspiration from sayings and mottos of others as well. So I'm really excited and keen to explore why these sayings inspire you and how you've used them as well to guide your career. Yeah, it's, it's great that you noticed. And I put it on, I think, on my LinkedIn profile as well. Sometimes you just need a little guidance from people who are philosophical thinkers. At least that's what I had. When I had a tough time in life, I didn't know where I wanted to go. Uh, who was I? Who am I? Who I want to be? All those big questions that people can rarely answer. And I thought, hey, I need some help on this. Let's maybe go into philosophy. I've always had a, a great interest in philosophy. And I started reading. And for me, what resonated was the Stoic philosophy. And Epictetus is one of the founding fathers of that. He's really talking about make the best use of what's in your power and take the rest as it happens, which basically means that some things are in our control and some things are not. Now, you might think of the circle of influence, that's all modern stuff, but I went back to reading the original books that he actually, one of the students printed. And, you know, things that are in our control is my own opinion, is my own feeling, is my own desire. And in a word, whatever is my own action. Things that are not in my control are, for instance, my reputation, my commands, and uh, what people think of me. You know, th that's not within my control. So let's not worry about that. Because if I worry about something that's not in my control, I cannot focus on what's actually sure. in my control. I noticed one time that I was worrying about everything and say, well, let's just bring it down a bit. Let's focus on what's in my control. And I spent the rest of my career, and I think I will do that the rest of my life, just understanding what's in my control. And once you're progressing your career, there will become more in your control. So there will be more focus on a lot of things. But for me, understanding what the key difference is, is really important. And before I go to Michel de Montaigne, another thing that's really struck me from Epictetus is, for instance, don't surrender your mind, which might be a quote that needs some more explanation. So one example that he gives, for instance, if someone were to casually give your body to any other person, you would probably be very upset. You would be furious. But why do we then always give our mind to other people's thoughts and how they interact as well? You should be just as furious about you surrendering your mind to someone else's opinion compared to someone surrendering your body. So that's also something that guided me. And the motto of Michel de Montaigne, what do I know, is basically when I was around 24, 25, I thought I knew it all. I went to my uh, manager then, Marcel van Buiten, and I remember it. I said, well, I've actually learned it all. I've exhausted. And uh, now this is it. What else can I do? And he said to me, Max, you never know everything. And I think more uh, people of that age think that they know everything. And that started a thought in my head saying, yeah, don't be so arrogant or narrow-minded saying you know everything you don't. And then I came across this motto of Michel de Montaigne, what do I know? Which actually means start listening to others and start getting those external perspectives in. And that's why I, for instance, have all those calls within my network, not for me to tell them what to do, but to hear their story and say, hey, Ah, that's a great angle. I didn't think of this. Let me interact more and let me take that into myself. So my starting point is, I know nothing. Let's just listen to this and maybe I could add some value, but let my starting position be, what Excellent. do I know? Fantastic. Uh, one of the sayings that I personally like, uh, which isn't too dissimilar to um, a Pixitus one, which is, uh, life isn't about waiting for the storms to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain. Um, so when there is a, a difficult situation that you're in, and you know, it's very easy yeah, to look nice. at the downsides, but actually positivity can come out of the most difficult situations. It's good to have things sometimes that external motivators like yeah. that. I think it's, I think it's really useful. So look, fantastic uh, responses so far, Max, but what we're going to go now to is we're going to open the vault. Entering the vault. One piece of advice you would give okay. to someone working in payroll right now. I would uh, echo what I said before, share your story. You need it. 
we need it as a payroll profession. So help elevate our profession by sharing your story. You can do that in a multitude of ways. You can write an article, simply go to a networking event, share your story with someone that's sitting next to you. We can only grow if you help us grow by sharing your story. So please do so and know that you are heard and that you Fantastic. do have a story. With the benefits of hindsight, what would be the one career decision you would change? I think it would be none because I know where I'm now and I'm super happy to be where I am now. And if I would change something, that would probably would mean that I would not be in the position where I'm now. So and that's also something uh, that I've learned. Let's not dwell on, on decisions I made in the past. Just be happy where I am now and learn from those previous decisions. But no, Excellent. I won't change Fantastic. anything. Good. Um, if you had the power of foresight and you could change the entire payroll industry with one action or improvement, what would that action or improvement be? Well, um, I don't think this might change the entire industry, but I have a vision and I've seen a portion of it at Congress in Washington uh, earlier this year. It would be that we get rid of those PDF base mm. slips. It would be an interactive base slip that someone can go into. If they click on a number, it brings you to the policy. It brings you to how the tax is calculated in layman's terms. It brings you to what the schedule would be when you are paid. It would even bring you to uh, maybe even your bank account where it hits the salary. And it would maybe also say, hey, you are expected to turn uh, 50 or 60 in two months time. That has an impact on your tax saying, hey, your net salary might go up or down a bit then. And by the way, if you want to change that, you have these decision points to make. Click yes or no, and we'll take care of the rest. So basically, your payslip becomes an interactive explanatory document for you to interactively link between a policy, between finance, between the banking, between tax. I think that would revolutionize payroll and would lower the questions that employees have and empower them. Excellent. Their own very, very uh, innovative. It's like a self-service payslip. I, I think the... Uh... Software companies exactly. listening to this may be making some notes, Max. Uh, I've got um, Anita Letting uh, from NGA coming <laughs> onto the podcast in a couple of weeks' time. and She's talking about blockchain and future okay. technology and things like that. So uh, I may raise that question with her to see what she yeah. thinks, if there's any product developments we can let the world know about. It'd be interesting. Great response. Who motivates you and why? Ooh, I think my wife motivates me for being the best person that I can. And I also basically motivate myself. I never accept the status quo. If I uh, am in a position now or I, I know stuff, I want to know the next thing. I want to know more because if you stand still, you're not growing anymore. And I think when I grow, I help my team grow. When I have those connections with senior leaders, it helps to raise their profile. So it motivates me to be the best I can whenever I can, because I know it has an effect on other people as well. And, you know, nothing truly stops you and nothing truly holds you back if you just go out there and be the best you can. So I would say uh, what motivates me is it never accepting the status quo and always be better and know more and listen more and do more in payroll community. And I could not do that without the support of my wife that allows me to do all this payroll stuff. And yes, to bring in that laptop again, writing a course or going on a trip and she taking care of my daughter. Great so kudos answer. To her. Fantastic. Last question in the vault. If you didn't work in payroll, what would you be doing? I think I would be trying to get into payroll if I hear a certain comment about what payroll does, uh, like taking the best of all different functions. But probably since I started commercial economics, uh, when I dropped out of it and, and went into payroll, it would have probably been something where I could talk a lot because, <laughs> as you notice, I'm quite talkative. So, Or it could be somewhere in accounting. I think uh, I like the accounting side of things. But I truly don't know. Uh, I'm happy to have rolled into payroll, but I think I would have rolled into anything else as well. But I wouldn't have been as happy as I'm now. Fantastic. I'm going to ask one actually additional question just for the listeners of the podcast, because we've got people of all levels listening from payroll clerk right through to global payroll managers based all over the globe. If there were, say, three, four, five quick bullet pointed pieces of advice that you would give to people who wants to elevate their career, um, one of them, for example, you mentioned would be to share your story. Are there any quick takeaway piece of advice uh, or other bullet points you could quickly add to that for those that can instantly take away from this podcast and start implementing tomorrow? I would say uh, be good at everything, but be super good at one thing. That's what elevated my career. And for instance, you can be a data wizard or you can be very good at international tax legislation, but... A stand out and at least one thing. And if you go to work tomorrow and you think, 
I'm actually really good at this. Tell people that you're good at that and show people that you're good at that. If you want to be more engaged in the wider organization, just send someone an email, send someone a message, connect with someone on LinkedIn, be out there, get connected. I would say start your network. And this is something that someone told me yesterday. They say, Max, how did you how did you manage to grow this network? I say, well, just by reaching out to people. So I would advocate everyone to do that. And if you are working in payroll and you have not yet gotten your, your free social your certification, you know, the CPP or the CAPP in the UK, I would say go out and get that because we tend to forget sometimes that we're also payroll. We need to know our stuff. If you are uh, developing a new global payroll strategy, go and visit those courses, talk to other people if you're more at the senior level. And what I would do instantly is say, payroll branding you know we have our own i have my own hashtag passion for payroll but i also learned from other people they have for instance hashtag Mm. payroll rocks and they send a slide back to senior leaders each payroll cycle with the big hashtag payroll rocks and just with some key figures into it to get traction for payroll so nothing stops you from also doing that and make your own hashtag and make visible the great work that you're doing every day. Fantastic. I think that's a brilliant way to round off the podcast. So Max van der Klispersink, Max the philosopher, Max the vision award winner for 2018, Max the global payroll <laughs> manager uh, and founder of the GPCF model. A huge thank you for me. It's been a fantastic podcast. I, I've thoroughly enjoyed listening to every minute of it. I want to say a huge thank you for joining me today. Um, I will, of course, add uh, links to your LinkedIn profile and to some of your presentations and to the articles and webinars from the GPMI Institute into the episode notes. So if anyone's interested in finding out more about any aspect of this podcast, please do check the episode notes for more information. Uh, apart from that, let's uh, wish England luck this evening. And Max, I want to say a huge thank you for, for joining me on the Payroll Podcast. It's been an absolute Thanks pleasure. For having me. I will uh, speak to you all again in a couple of weeks. Thanks a lot. You've been listening to the Payroll Podcast with Nick Day of JGA Recruitment, specialist payroll recruiters. If you would like to feature on a future podcast, please contact us. For a wealth of world-class payroll content, please visit us at jgarecruitment.com. See you next week.